Hello, Acron fans, and welcome to an exhibition match between Chitin and Kron Aberrant on Kratoria. This is actually a rather interesting match because both Chitin and Kron Aberrant had agreed prior to this match to not use hierarchies. In case you're unfamiliar, hierarchies are a command convenience in Acron that allows players to control large groups of units by only controlling one unit. This is really useful because of the chrono energy cost of controlling units means that you can't control groups of units in the deep past. Using hierarchies, you simply order one unit and the other units that are tied to that unit, that are subordinates, will follow. Now, there's been some debate as to whether the hierarchies should be used, and to try to resolve this debate, or at least to figure out, hmm, I wonder if hierarchies really are that necessary for the game, Karn Everton kind of decided to play some test games. This is one of them, and it is going to be Kitan as CISO versus Kron Aberrant as hasn't said his race yet, let's double check on him. He is going for Grekim. So it's a Grekim versus CISO match on Kratoria, which we've seen a couple times before, but I'll just go over it again. It's a 320x320 map, which is about medium sized. The two bases are in the top right and bottom left corners, the northeast southwest. They each have 5LC and 4QP, oh, sorry, 6LC and 4QP, but spread out in a rather circular fashion. There's a nearby expansion that is visible to both players. These comm hubs, sorry, comm centers, te teleporters, and chronoporters are neutral, and both players have vision of them. They're allied to both players. This is a unique feature of Kratoria, or rather, the chronoporters and comm centers are. There are other maps with neutral teleporters. And the nearest expansion is also guarded by neutral, destructible armories and heavy tanks and RPs, so it's a bit harder to get to. The nearest expansion that's easy to get to is over in the southeast and northwest, kind of spread across two different positions. There's five LC and five QP crates. And that's all there really is for resources. There's a small expansion section here, but I'm not 100% sure if it's actually pathable for vehicles. I don't think it's pathable for vehicles, it might be pathable for infantry. Anyhow, Titan is going for rather quickly getting Six, well, not super quickly, but he's getting six LCRPs, getting Importer, getting Factory. Crown Abbott, on the other hand, is getting his six LCRPs, he's actually getting eight LCRPs. He's already put his Arcticus forward, as is normal. And Kitan's jumping back a bit, looks like he is also sending out a Special Ops towards Crown Abbott's base. Crown Abbott has not sent out any scouting units yet, which is not surprising. Grekham does not scout very often this early in the game. Usually they get a couple Octos about the two minute mark and then send those in. Though, interestingly, Kron Aberrant isn't actually sending any Octos out at this point. He's using everything for regeneration. He has not sent out any Scouts yet. He is not at all worried about Scouts, which is interesting to see. You don't often see that, although mentally, like I said, for Grekham players, it's not super common just because Grekham would have to spend about 90 LC to get the Scouting Unit, while Vecure and CISO pretty much get the Scouting Unit for free. However, Octos are very powerful, and if used right, can be an effective harassment force, along with being an effective scouting force. Regardless, Crown Abbott has decided not to go for this, he is going instead just for base development, getting a quick octopod for base defense, and Chitin, about 30 seconds down from there, is getting an ATHC. He has not decided building more units yet, he has no reserves to do it yet, he's going to get another reserve in about 5 seconds. The armory is not researching anything yet, so Chitin is not going for any tech, he doesn't have any of the resources for tech either, he only has 24 QP, and all techs cost at minimum 40 QP for CISO. Kron Aberrant, like I said, continuing with his economic expansion, he is going for... Well, like I said, he had Octopod for defense, but he didn't actually use it in that iteration. He's just jumping back about 10 seconds, setting it in a better position to defend from the Special Ops, and it will be very effective in defense against that Special Ops. Special Ops just take a lot of damage from Octopods. Well, I should say, take a lot of damage... They don't take a lot of damage to kill. They have 100 health, and Octopods deal quite a bit of damage quite quickly, so they're effective at getting rid of early harassment forces. And it looks like Kronam has decided to start fighting himself. It appears that he doesn't consider Kitan to be enough of a challenge, so he's deciding to use his own units against themselves. No, I'm kidding. Seriously though, it must have been a misclick on his part. He has fixed that up and sent the Faro out to help defend. Good idea, Faro's are detector units and ATHCs can cloak, so anticipating Kitan's ATHC attack, which is always wise, CISO tends to go for ATHCs, and Kitan is indeed sending his ATHC in right now at the 409 mark, which the Faro and Octopod will be able to intercept quite handily before it actually deals any real damage. However, it is attacking the Faro, which means that the Octopod will have to deal enough damage to destroy it, which it will, before the Faro dies, and another Faro coming in to back up in case the first Faro died, which is very smart. 
And mechs come in. So kind of just did a quick harassment scouting. Not doesn't seem to be doing much of that at this point. He may be doing something more in the future. He is sending an ATC out towards the northwest expansion to see if Cronavon has decided to expand there yet, which he has not. And Kaiden also is expanding. He's sending a marine to the southeast expansion, the central southeast expansion, to start building some more RPs. He has a couple mechs up. Probably going to use those for macro fabs pretty soon, but right now I'm just worried about getting out of the factory. Surprised he's going for so many mechs, though. Or rather, I'm surprised he's going for only two mechs. Mechs are powerful anti air units, and Grekum are fond of using air in general. So getting a lot of mechs for anti-air is not a terrible idea, it's not unexpected, but usually CISO players will focus more on getting quick frigates out for anti-air rather than using the mechs, just because mechs are, I mean, they are power. They are powerful in groups and fairly cheap, but they're also slow. So not bad for base defense, but for offense is a bit tricky to work with. Though without hierarchies, it does make it a bit harder for the Grecum to move around an air force because the biggest thing about Air Force that makes it very powerful is that it's great at mix-up. Actually, hold that thought. The Faros are coming to attack. Wow, okay, Kron is actually sending his Faros in to attack the expansion that Kaiden was setting up in the southeast, central southeast, while sending his Octopod, probably teleported in, to get rid of, just double check this, no, I kind of didn't even see it. So Kron jumped back for 30 seconds, I'm guessing he did teleport it in, and he is sending it to the teleporter, and yes, from there it is going to be teleported right into Kaiden's base. So Kaiden is going, well, there's a lot to deal with now. So Kaiden jumped back about to the 429 mark from the 6 minute mark or so. Yeah, 6 minute mark exactly, actually. And he is setting... Well, he's getting machinery, so he can quite easily get Tornados and use that to help against the Octopods. Which I wouldn't be surprised if he did, but he doesn't have a lot of QP to do it. Oh, it looks like he tried to do it, or tried to build something big. Probably tried to build Tornados, didn't have the resources for it. He can only build one Tornado right now. And building... An import right next to where the Octopod V looks like he's trying to intercept it by putting buildings in the way. But Cron Aberrant is. He is sending his far Faros in, and the Octopod will be sent very soon to attack. And there it goes! The Octopod has come into attack, not blocked by the importers. I don't know if that was Kitan's plan or what. But Kitan does not have the defense units. He does He does have a Tornado, though. He is getting a Tornado, jumping back about 15 seconds before the attack hits. He's getting a Tornado. Sorry, 5 seconds, but. He is getting a Tornado that will be ready, however, only in about 35 seconds, so I expect to see at least two RPs destroyed. Well, of course, these Faros are doing quite a number on the RPs in the Central Southeast Expansion, and at the same time, Cron Aberrant, I should say the 540 mark, Cron Aberrant is getting a Faropod as well. Faropods being cloaked bomb units, very powerful against anything that doesn't have detection. Farop being teleported into the main base of Chitin as well to help out, so... The one Faro in the natural expansion, sorry, natural expansion, the southeast central expansion, another Faro helping out destroy Chitin's main, and Chitin's Tornad is just finished at the 626 mark. It is just finished attacking the Octopod. We'll be able to take care of the Octopod quite quickly, but it is going to take permanent damage in the process. But at the same time, the Faro still attacking the RPs. This RP will be going down before the Tornad has managed to defend it. But Chitin is in a very tight spot when it comes to defense. He has, however, got an ATHC right next to Crown Amber's base, and bit surprised he hasn't decided to use it yet. And Cronheimer at the 629 mark is sending his Faropod over to get rid of this ATHC, which had not cloaked actually. It was left out in the open uncloaked. It had run out of energy, so it automatically decloaked. And the Faro being destroyed, not able to destroy the RP actually. The RP surviving with 9 health, one more hit on the RP would have killed it, but no, it survives. Kaiden only loses one RP, just barely, but he only loses one RP, which is good for him. And Cronheimer. Okay, so Kaiden's jumping back to the 6 minute mark. Looks like he's sending his ATHC. He has close to see here. He's not sending it to attack yet, but he might be sending it to attack at this point. I'll have to keep an eye on that one. He is, however, sending a mech over to take care of the far or build a defense turret. Yes, that's right, because defense turrets are that big. Building a defense turret right next to the Faro, but it will be a little bit too late. That Faro will probably end up killing it before it actually deals any meaningful damage. And the Trinod here, nothing changed here. Faro pod, also nothing has changed, so. Kitan looks like he's trying to help defend against this. He, like I said, he did change this. Setting up his defense turret a bit closer to his mech, so it has a chance to build up before the Faro is able to destroy it, and yes, we'll be able to build up in time and help fend off the Faro. The two Tornods, however, sorry, two Tornods, now he managed to build a second one, so the Tornods managed to fend off the main base, so Kitan has fended off the harassment, except the Faropods still coming in. However, Tornods are detectors, which means the Faropods will have a difficult time harassing the main base. That being said, there aren't a lot of anti-air units to actually deal with the Faropod, but the Faropod being a bomber itself means the Tornods won't be able to there won't be damage too much that will be able to deal enough damage to the Faropod before the Faropod deals enough damage to kill either of them, or at least kill both of them. So back to what I was saying before regarding 
air units. The big thing about air units in, well, any RTS game, particularly Akron because of the time travel mechanics, is that air units are very powerful mix-up sources. And this is more of a term from fighting games, but basically mix-up means when you're setting up yourself in a position where your opponent has to guess what your move will be. And they have no easy way to guess, but they have to guess. Like The options available to you, given what they know so far, are amb so ambiguous that they have to choose between two different options for defense that may not necessarily work. A classic example in fighting games is the high-low mix-up, where you attack, you use an attack, or in a position where you could use an attack that could be either overhead, which requires they block high, or a low attack, which requires that they crouch block, and doing it in such a way that it's very difficult for them to guess which type of attack you're going to use, so they might end up getting hit. Now, with air units and Akron, this is more a question of position mix-up, where the enemy player doesn't know where the air units are going to end up, ultimately. Now, this is really helpful with hierarchies, because you can just use mass amounts of air units, send them around the map, and then if your opponent starts attacking them, you can retreat, you can move them around, and your opponent basically can't guess where your air units are going to be, because there's so many points where they could attack, expansions, main bases, and different angles. You, their opponent doesn't know what it's going to be until right next to the unplayable pass, so it's very difficult to counter that, especially with ground units. So playing without hierarchies, we'll probably not see a lot of this behavior. We might see a few areas being used to just generally harass and confuse the opponent, but probably won't come up very often just because hierarchies aren't being used in this game. So a large hierarchy of air units won't be usable, and thus they can only be moved around a lot near the present and, and near past, but not much in the deep past. So doing re-micro across the timeline, going back and back and back across the timeline, changing where the air units are ultimately attacking from is going to become impossible. Anyway, Farpot is coming to try to harass the expansion that's getting set up to the central southeast, and Crown Abbott, of course, setting up, setting up his expansion at his natural expansion, breaking everything up, and Kitan being, of course, well aware of this happening, should point out. Kitan is well aware that Crown Abbott is building his expansion here, so both players are fully aware of the other's expansions, and Crown Abbott is doing what he can to harass, actually not doing a terrible job of harassment. He has managed to kill two or three RPs here and there. It's not... The, Super great, although Kitan, I mean, Kitan has got a lot of resources in the bank. He's not spending as much as he could be. He does have a macro fab, but probably going to start building more tanks and frigates now, which is the typical thing for Cizo to build. While Cron Aberrant has Gate Tech coming up, and not a whole lot of resources on top of that. He has enough resources to build a couple more units, but he doesn't have a lot of resources to Chronoport with, which means he won't be able to use that, well, actually, he will be able to use that decently well, because he doesn't have a very large army at this point. So I expect Cron Aberrant to be doing some Chronoporting shenanigans fairly soon, but I don't expect that's going to be super meaningful at this point in the game, just because there aren't a lot of powerful units that are being used. However, Kitan also doesn't have a huge defense at the point in time that Cron Abbott could attack, so it will come down to the angle, but I think that as long as Cron Abbott attacks the main base and not this natural over here, he should be fine. It should be able to deal a decent amount of damage before it propagates to the... Wait a sec. Speaking of which, <laughs> here we go, right here in the red timeline. So, on the red time wave, we see... Cronaberant has Chronoport back, and I really wish I could go back there, but neither player has actually decided to look at that right now. Neither Kitan nor Cronaberant has decided to look at that, so Cronaberant is attacking Kitan something. However, the Chronoport itself, the arrival is going to be wiped... No, it's not... Yeah, it's going to be wiped off the timeline, because the departure got wiped off the timeline. I'm not sure where the departure was ultimately coming from, which is rather bothersome. I kind of wish I was paying attention to Cronaberant at the time. Regardless... Here we are. The far pod. There was a far pod right here in the main base, which is exactly where Cronaberg should have attacked, and thus was successful. I apparently destroyed everything down here. Would have destroyed everything down here, but more for the fact that his far pod apparently got destroyed prior to being able to actually chronoport. And yes, it looks like the far pod got destroyed right here before he was able to chronoport. Thus, Cronaberg didn't actually manage to deal any real damage. Though in the meantime, he, well, that mean time, mean meta time, we do see that he would have been able to damage quite a few of the RPs. Though at this point, Kitan has so many tanks and Mar tanks, it doesn't really matter. Crown Armour's really got to worry more about base defense, got to worry more about making sure he can fend off the attack coming in at the 1149 mark that Kitan is sending. And also near to the present, we see that Kitan has decided to send off an attack. And okay, the Crown Armour's Crown Report has been ultimately successful. It looks like Crown Armour will be... No, he's... No, it's not successful. I think he's trying to permaclone that far, but that's the only reason I can see why it would keep going on and off the timeline like that. I can only see that as the only explanation, really. I cannot imagine he's just paradoxing randomly like that, especially since it just happened twice. Anyway, the 
more tanks and regular tanks coming in to attack the natural expansion of the Sipipod is defending with the dome and the dome has the beam as well so we'll be able to deal heavy amounts of damage once and more tank coming in is now in range of the dome but is also and it is getting hit by the beam attack it's also just in range of the dome generally the more tanks aren't being spotted for properly the more tanks are actually in a bad really out of position the tanks should go in front as a spot for the more tanks but no it is not the more tanks are going Far enough in front that it, they will be taking a lot of damage. They don't need to be going this far in front. They are artillery units. They have enough dam they have enough range. That they could be able to attack everything without having to worry about it. And they can spot. If they have a spotter, they can attack it. They have a larger range and they have sight, like most artillery units in most RTS games. And so, with another unit spotting for them, they will do quite well. Now, Crown Aberrant has not ultimately dealt the damage. The damage I was mentioning before about the Crown Port that ultimately did not happen. Crown Aberrant did not get that Crown Port going. So, Chitin has nothing to worry about in the unplayable past. But Chitin's attack is doing quite a bit of damage, and Chronomer, a bit further in the future, has a Chronoported Sepipod coming in to help out with the attack, which is something that's quite nice to see because we don't often see Chronoported units going to help themselves out and to help out in a battle that's not near the unplayable past. But no, this is actually in the playable past, but Chronomer is using that playable past to actually take advantage. Let's see where we're now. Okay, Chitin just went past the Chronoport now, but. Yeah, Crown Aberrant is taking advantage of the fact that the Playable Past is a bit more meaningful with the lack of hierarchies to do more chronoporting and not have to worry so much about the Unplayable Past, though it looks like he still is going to have some chronoporting arrival going on here. So once that chronoport arrives, we'll see what happens, but he does have some defense going on. Ultimately not super meaningful, though. That's the one thing that's a little bit sad about this. Mind you, it was... It was Sleepy Pods, not Fire Pods. The Fire Pods coming in, and the Fire Pods, getting past the Tornod, will be able to start dealing damage to Chitin's forces, but... There we go, there's that Chronoport I was looking for. So Chronoport has Chronoport back the Farapod to attack the forces as they come in, rather than attacking the forces once they're already halfway into Chronoport's base. So we will see the effects of that fairly soon. Chitin actually is looking at the effects of that right now, so we'll go check that out. And it looks like... No, he's not looking at the effects of that, they haven't propagated yet. So once we get this blue time of coming along, we will see the effects propagate. Chronoport, however, is still in a very tight... He's in a very tight spot, he is... But, Five tanks, two more tanks coming in, and here we go. Crown is now double checking the attack as it comes in, and the Fire Pods are now dealing meaningful damage and dealing with the force as it comes in. So this is a successful Chronoport defense. The Tornado is in, not in position to defend against the Fire Pods, so these tanks are completely powerless to destroy this Fire Pods. And the Fire Pods are cloaked and have more than enough energy to last, so these tanks are dead. Crown is going to have no problem defending against these forces right now. Though, this is once the blue time wave comes along. Chitin double checking the blue time wave. He does see that the defense was successful, and Chronomart actually has a pretty sizable army inside his natural expansion. Quite a few Faros, a couple Faro pods, and Octo Sepi pods. So he does have enough to defend against any more attacks that Chitin may send in the near future. Or I should say the deep past, but the near future relative to that. But, of course, since the blue time wave has not crossed through yet, we don't see that, that exactly going on. And it looks like the blue time wave. Oh, sorry, this damage is from before the blue time wave hit, so... Crown Armor, now chronoporting back another couple of Faro Pods... Or, no, he didn't actually chronoport back another couple of Faro Pods. What the hell? He is jumping back to double-check the attack that came in, and it looks like another... There is another attack coming in, but since it's only Tornados and Martanks, nothing particularly effective at killing air. The Faro Pods are doing a good job defending more tanks and Martanks coming in, following up that Tornado, but Chitin has lost a lot of his army, to this nice last-ditch defense by Crown Aberrant, and also lost a lot of his resources that he spent on it. Crown Aberrant now has a surplus of resources that he can use to rebuild his army, get more units. Oh, it looks like the Far Pods did ultimately get destroyed, and the Octopod, an Octopod coming in to help defend. It won't be able to last, though. It won't be able to deal enough damage to actually deal with this. It is Corner Pointing Back to help support the units as they were defending originally around the 1445 mark. And this is the second wave of tanks and more tanks coming in, I should say, which are being effectively defended against. This will not... Okay, so Crown Armor has successfully defended against everything Chitin has sent up to the 15 minute mark, but it looks like Chitin is still sending a lot of attacks near the present. So Crown Armor is going to have to deal with this. Mind you, these attacks are going to be weakened as the green time wave comes along. As this green time wave comes along, the Crown we saw earlier that Crown Armor is currently paying attention to are going to be far more meaningful. And Crown Armor actually paying attention to them now. We see that, oh, even with that. Even with that, Chitin has actually managed to send enough units in, managed to build enough units. He is constantly building units from his main base right now, building Tornads and Mar tanks, just pumping them out. He has enough resources to do that. Quite constantly pumping out. So, Crown Armor putting up a very valiant defense, but unfortunately running out of 
units, he's not, not resources, mind you. He has enough resources to defend. Getting three more fire pods up, but he's not building up enough. He doesn't have a lot of chrono energy left, mind you, and he does need to use that chrono energy to cl both cloak and defend with the chrono porting. So he's chrono porting back a couple of the fire pods, sending... Well, keeping them in the main base, because he doesn't have enough chrono energy to actually do a real unplayable pass attack, do a real uppercut. And Chitin is able to destroy the natural expansion at the 1813 mark. Cryonard paying attention to the... Well, he was paying attention to the 15-minute mark, now at the 19-minute mark, and losing his entire base that he had. Though he does have the expansion here, it's not particularly meaningful since it doesn't have any production units of any sort. But now that the Far Pods have been chrono ported back to the 15-minute mark, once the blue time... Or sorry, once the red time wave comes up, it should be able to propagate that, if not then the blue time wave, I'm pretty sure is... Actually, I'm pretty sure the blue time wave is the one that is going to be carrying that propagation. And the far pods... Oh, whoa! No, he's corner ported back the progening units entirely. That's... Did I see that right? I, I think he actually just corner ported away his progenerating units. Yeah, he deprogened them and is... Corner porting them into the deep pass, and oh yeah, he's, he's just doing an, a UPP move. Corner porting them to the deep pass and moving them out of the way. Though he has to actually move them physically first, but still trying to defend. That's a really neat idea for defense. Very difficult to make work given the position in the past. And Kaiden has at the 18 minute mark, well, sorry, the 20 minute mark, he destroyed Karnamar's base, now focusing on the 1848 mark and is destroying Karnamar's base. Karnamar, his Seppis have not come through, or well, Seppi Faro, whatever he managed to send back, has not come through yet. But an Octo has actually gone through, but that was from an earlier Chronoport. I'm not sure how successful his Chronoports were, though, but he is double-checking them, and it looks like the Faro and Octo are going to Chronofrag themselves, which is unfortunate. So the Seppi managed to get back successfully, but the Chrono but everything else didn't, which means he won't be able to actually rebuild anything. Which is quite sad, since rebuilding anything would require a Faro at the very minimum. And he did not send that back successfully. So it looks like the Seppi... Well, the Seppi's not going to be enough. It was sent back successfully, but it's not going to be enough to save him. Farbot doing what it can, doing a valiant job, protected by the reefs. If it can actually destroy the Tornads, which it might be able to, it, it would be able to stay alive, but I don't think it can. It looks like Cranmer was defeated about 8 seconds from now. And that's... Yeah, that's going to be it. Fortunately, got too close. The Tornads couldn't kill him, but the, the Mar tanks and tanks could. So Kitan really has won this game now. It looks like Kronheimer will not be able to get out of this alive, though. Very interesting play from him, though. Very nice Kronoport defense. And it was interesting to see, interesting to see how much... Well, okay, it's interesting, interesting to see how little changed from the looks of it. Though, once again, this is the first game that either player would have really adapted to the changes caused by not using hierarchies. And it was interesting to see what happened. I, I'm curious to see more games play like this. And for all of you watching out there, I'd be very interested to see how you guys play with this, see games from you guys, just play this, make the games, post the replays on gamereplays.org, because I really want to see how this plays out. I mean, we're all quite curious to see how this plays out, because the idea is that it would make the near past more useful and make uppercuts a lot less powerful, and we did see in this game that uppercuts were a lot less powerful. Chrono was unable to defend with the uppercuts, though Kitan didn't really need to use that. And actually, Kitan won without having chrono porting, which is saying a lot. Corner porting is quite powerful in this game. It's a game decider, really. And here's that Seppi I was talking about right now. It, like I said, the only one that actually survived, the only one that didn't chrono frag itself. But, yeah, that's the thing. He stayed alive quite effectively, despite the fact that he did not have hierarchies to make it efficient. But it did mean that it was a weaker, weaker ability to uppercut. And I think he might have been relying on that in his strategy. He wasn't really considering the fact that he wouldn't be able to uppercut as effectively. And it looks like he's actually going for... Permaclone, huh. I think he's trying to permaclone that Seppi, but I'm not sure. And near the unplayable past, it looks like... Mm, well, if he is trying to permaclone the Seppi, I don't... I don't know, it, it could work. It looks like... He has managed to, but the thing is, it doesn't matter. Because there's no real permaclone that would matter, since he's lost all of his units at this point. Like, that's This is where the departure happens. So this Seppi... Oh no, it wasn't permaclone, sorry. It was... It was a proper stable time loop, so that Seppi was not chrono ported as Cronomet wanted to see what would happen. But anyway, as I was saying, so yeah, the near pass is supposed to be more useful, and we kind of saw that. We did see between the one like minus one minute and minus two minute 
periods relative, it was a bit more useful. Players were focusing more on that point in time. Less focus on the minus two to minus three section, which is where the games are often focused. No focus being present in minus one minute, though. I Apparently, there was another game played that the replay didn't work out, so I can't show that, unfortunately, because apparently it was a really cool game. But the game in question had more use in the present. Apparently, the actual game-ending attack came in the present. And this game, the game-ending attack did come around a minute and a half in the past. So it's interesting to see the change. I want to see more games like this because one game is nowhere near enough to make any real statements, but you know, seeing a dozen or two dozen games should be a lot more indicative of what kind of change No Hierarchies brings to the table. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that, and have a good night, everyone.